Hello, and welcome to Grand Dukes of the West, episode 15, How the Tables Have Turned. Before we get started, I'd like to note that I recently had COVID, and I'm better now, but not 100% over it. So, if I sound scratchy or stuffy in this episode, that's why, and hopefully won't in the next episode. We left off last episode with the beginning of Charles VI's descent into madness. Philip had accompanied his nephews on the campaign to Brittany, and so was on hand for Charles's first episode. Some modern scholars believe that Charles suffered from a form of paranoid schizophrenia, but it is impossible to be sure. Doubtless, however, is the fact that from now on, Charles's repeated absences, as his retreats from lucidity were often called, made ruling the kingdom effectively a near impossibility for him. According to Foissart, there had been some warning signs over the past few months about the king's ill health, and Charles's doctors had even urged him not to go on the expedition to Brittany. But the king's delusions in the forest of Lama were far more intense than anything that had happened up to that point. In the ensuing chaos, Philip managed to take charge of the situation. Once Charles VI was subdued, he was taken to Lama, while Philip took control of the army. The Duke of Burgundy immediately cancelled the expedition and sent an embassy to the Duke of Brittany. This embassy blamed the campaign on bad advice from evil counsellors. While this is the age-old deflection from a king's mistakes, in this case it was merited, as the campaign was the brainchild of the Constable of France, Olivia de Clisson. Philip the Bold and John of Montfort had a good working relationship, and thus a negotiated settlement was in the best interest of both. A quick end to the conflict between Brittany and France would prevent the army from ravaging the duchy and would serve to strengthen Philip's position at court, while eroding that of the constable, who was, after all, an enemy of the Dukes of Brittany and Burgundy. But peace with Brittany was only the first step on Philip's path back to the top. Olivia de Clisson had both pushed for and funded the expedition to Brittany, so the cancellation of that expedition not only represented a large sunk cost for the constable, it also had a similar effect as Philip Helder's campaign did four years earlier. De Clisson then further eroded his position at court and in the army, by now being unable to pay for much of what was promised at the beginning of the expedition, as he could now no longer rely on plunder to raise funds. Once the immediate military situation had been dealt with, focus shifted to the king's health. Charles arrived at Le Mans in a coma, but this only lasted for a few days. After regaining consciousness, Charles was still out of it for the next few weeks. While the king had not regained all his strength, he was deemed fit to travel, and so, after about two weeks at Le Mans, the royal party began a much slower return trip to Paris. Philip, for his part, blamed the episode on Charles' lifestyle. The king was a rich 20-something, and so was living a life of luxury and debauchery. I wouldn't call him a hedonist, per se, but Charles did spend many nights staying up late, drinking, and partying, and that does take a toll. However, Philip's assignment of blame was likely more of a political move to separate the king from his enablers and insert himself as a caretaker than an official diagnosis. Once back in the Ile de France, a meeting of the high nobility of France was called to figure out the situation. It was here that Philip really cemented his position. Louis, the Duke of Orléans, now 20 years old, made his own bid for power, but, quoting Jonathan Sumption, quote, If Charles had been dead or permanently incapacitated, his claim would have been unanswerable. But, with the king nominally in command of his affairs, the Duke of Burgundy prevailed by the sheer force of his personality and the strength of his following. So within a month of returning to Paris, Philip and his brother John were reassuming control of the French government and began a purge of the marmosets. Some were simply dismissed, but others were arrested or sent into exile. Many of these dismissals and arrests were made on the basis that the marmoset ministers had engaged in corruption and graft. Now this might sound more than a little hypocritical coming from Philip the Bold, given the amount of money that he had taken from the French treasury. But this kind of thing does carry an internally consistent logic when you account for the entitlement of the high nobility. And I'm not just being snippy here. As a son of the king and first peer of the realm, Philip considered his influence over the king and access to the treasury as somewhat of a birthright. The marmosets thus usurped both from him when Charles came of age in Philip's mind, and now it was proper that he regained his former position at court and punished those that reached above their station. 
Never mind the fact that many of the marmosets had come from old and powerful noble families, even if they were not the highest lords of the land. The marmoset that Philip fought the hardest to remove was Olivia de Clisson. The move against de Clisson was encouraged by the Duke of Brittany's promise to cut his remaining ties with England if the constable was removed from his office and more generally from power in the French government. De Clisson and a few of Philip the Bold's other most hated marmosets were even slated for execution. While their sentences were all eventually changed to exile or imprisonment, for several days Parisians gathered in the Place de Greve in hopes of seeing some heads roll. In the aftermath of de Clisson's brush with death, the now former constable fled to his estates in Brittany. Duke John of Brittany now took advantage of the reversal of royal favor to trap de Clisson in one of his castles. But the enmity between the Bretons would not last forever. Olivia de Clisson was no longer a threat to Philip the Bold, so the Duke of Burgundy allowed the former constable's charges of corruption and graft to be dropped, and even facilitated a reconciliation between de Clisson and Montfort in 1396. The two men, who had been enemies for so long, would spend the rest of their lives as friends and allies, as they had been in their youth. In addition to the more dramatic trials of the leading marmosets, Philip the Bold spent the months following the first episode of Charles VI's madness removing royal officials loyal to the marmosets and putting his own men back in power. The generosity that Charles showed his former advisors was now turned against them, while Philip and John opened their pockets once again. But in moving to cement their claim to power by right of birth, they now had to contend with the Duke of Orléans. While the uncles were able to assert control over the government, their purge of the marmosets could not extend to Louis of Orléans. The young duke had now lost many of his political allies, but he could only be sidelined for so long. There were many who saw the four years of marmoset rule as a good thing, and many more who simply did not want the dukes of Berry and Burgundy to control the government again. Soon enough, opposition to the uncles began to solidify into something of an opposition party behind Louis of Orléans. Louis's own position and his relationship with his brother was unassailable, but he was still outpoliticked by Philip. So for the time being, he decided to fall in line behind his uncles in exchange for some political leverage. But he also began to build his own power base in hopes of one day supplanting him. Orléans was a wealthy duchy, and its revenues compensated for Louis's reduced ability to control the treasury. But we shouldn't fear that the young Duke of Orléans now had to learn how to balance a budget. He was still drawing huge sums of money from France. In fact, only Philip the Bold was drawing more than Louis in the years after 1392. Many blamed Louis's lack of political success in the early 1390s on his immaturity and his party boy lifestyle. In my research, the word that comes up most to describe the Duke of Orléans at this point is frivolous. So continuing that theme, as his uncle seized control of the French government, Louis seized control of the royal court's social calendar. As Louis grows older, he will never truly let go of his love of frivolity and fun, but he will develop into a skilled and savvy politician. His lust for power, wealth, and territories would only grow and was really only matched by his uncle Philip. This motivated his passion for the Italian campaign we discussed last time, and would later raise the stakes of his feud with the Dukes of Burgundy as he moved to acquire Luxembourg. More on that in a future episode. We can see that even at his young age, he was ambitious and willing to act on that ambition. He had already traded Touraine for Orléans, and in 1394, he added another territory, the county of Angoulême, to his growing list of possessions. The acquisition of Angoulême was a relatively minor one, and is most notable for the fact that, a few generations later, a count of Angoulême would become King Francis I. But back to the past. Well, the further past. Louis threw himself into planning feasts and dances and attended them with a similar gusto, and in doing so continued to strengthen that reputation for frivolity. One of the more striking anecdotes about Louis's impulsive and frivolous streak comes from a party thrown by Queen Isabeau. In early 1393, the queen threw a masquerade ball to celebrate the marriage of one of her ladies-in-waiting. This ball featured a dance of the wild men. These dances were popular in the later Middle Ages and featured men dressed as, well, wild men, or half-man, half-beast figures. Isabeau's masquerade featured six young nobles dressed in linen suits head-to-toe with flax attached using pitch or wax, and wearing matching masks to mimic a Bigfoot-like appearance. From that description, you might be able to tell that these outfits were extremely flammable, and so no torches were allowed near the dancers. 
Louis of Orléans showed up late to the party and quite drunk. Evidently, he had been pre-gaming, and wanted to get a better view of the dancers to figure out who they could be. He grabbed a torch and got a little too close to one of the dancers, and a wayward spark lit him up. The fire soon spread to three of the other wild men, and only two managed to avoid the flames. One jumped into a vat of wine, and the other, King Charles himself, was saved as the Duchess of Berry pulled her skirt over the king to protect him from the inferno. All four of the nobles who were set on fire died either that night or in the next few days, and it is for a good reason that this event is known as the Belle des Ardents, or the Ball of the Burning Men. Louis was widely condemned after the Ball des Ardents, and his standing with his uncles plummeted, but he would recover from the personally embarrassing and more widely tragic night. His reputation was also harmed in part by his wife's homeland. In 14th century France, Italy was seen as a land of witchcraft. So, in a bout of medieval bigotry, rumors that Valentina had bewitched the king and caused his madness were often spread around. But now we should take a moment to get properly introduced to the queen. Isabeau of Bavaria did more than just throw parties, and, as her husband's lack of ability to rule became more and more evident, the power that she held, both informal and as the guardian of her children, made her into one of the most important political figures in France. I mentioned her marriage to Charles VI very briefly in episode 10, but she really does deserve more of an introduction. Isabeau's marriage to Charles was arranged by Philip the Bold as another way for him to draw his family closer to the Wittelsbach House of Bavaria, which, if you recall, also ruled over the Low Country territories of Haino, Holland, and Zealand. Isabeau's father, Duke Stephen of Bavaria, initially objected to the match, as it was tradition for a prospective queen to be examined naked by a collection of court ladies who would judge, quote, whether she is fit and properly formed. Which, yeah. But, in the end, he consented to the match, and Isabeau was sent off to Haino, where she prepared for the wedding and began to learn the ways of the French court with her aunt, the Countess. The royal couple were married in the Cathedral of Amiens shortly after their first meeting. Originally, the plan was for them to be wedded at Ross, but Charles insisted on holding the wedding here and now. Isabeau was said to be very attractive, and Charles was 16 at the time, so that tracks. Isabeau of Bavaria didn't have a huge presence in royal politics before Charles' madness, but she was definitely a player at court, and was known to be somewhat of a peacemaker. She quickly secured her position by getting pregnant, and over the course of her marriage would have 12 children with the king. The queen found an ally in the Duke of Burgundy. She was in part grateful to Philip for helping to arrange her marriage to the king, and the Burgundians and Bavarians had a solid relationship more generally. Additionally, the two shared a dislike of the Duke and Duchess of Orléans. Isabeau's disdain came at first from the fact that Valentina Visconti's father, Gian Galeazzo, overthrew and likely poisoned his uncle Bernabeau, who happened to be Isabeau's grandfather, and later from the fact that while in the midst of his episodes of madness, the king seemed to prefer Valentina to the queen. So when Louis of Orléans was pushing his plans for an Italian campaign to his brother, Isabeau was often pushing back against them. And in 1393, Louis revived those plans for Italy. Philip did not stand in Louis's way, seeing his ambitions as a way to distract him from playing a larger part at court. But neither did Philip render much assistance, as he also saw them as needlessly provocative towards the English, Flemish, and other adherents of Rome, and expensive. But once again, these plans would come to nothing. Pope Clement VII, who had been instrumental in the initial preparations for the Italian campaign, now pushed back against Louis's ambitions. Clement was worried that Louis's ambitions for territory outweighed his goals of ending the schism, and that Louis's aid would come at the cost of large parts of the Papal States. And speaking of Clement VII, the Avignon Pontiff died in 1394. Louis and the Marmosets had been strident supporters of the Avignon Papacy, but as Philip and the other royal uncles were more moderate in their support and more eager to reach a reconciliation, the French court had begun to walk back their support of Avignon in the later years of Clement's life. That is not to say that the court of Charles VI ever considered changing their adherence to Rome, but rather that they began to seek out possible ends to the schism and push Clement to consider stepping down as Pope. Furthermore, as Philip's Flemish subjects largely paid heed to Rome, Philip began to push for toleration for schismatics in France. So when Clement died, a significant part of the French court wanted to take the opportunity to end the schism by urging the Avignon cardinals to avoid electing a new pope, and by urging the Roman Pope Boniface IX to step down so that a new pope who was untainted by the schism could be elected. 
However, by the time that the wishes of the French court arrived in Avignon, the doors to the papal conclave had already been locked. Before long, there was a new pope in Avignon, Benedict XIII, and once again, there were two popes, both unwilling to step down. But simply by being elected, Benedict had less support than Clement did, as his election was seen by many as doing more harm than good. He was still favored in France and other regions that had previously sworn allegiance to Avignon, but he did not have the same political heft that Clement was able to command. Like Clement, Benedict favored an end to the schism via a French invasion of Italy with the aim of chasing Boniface out of Rome, rather than having both popes step down. But now there was even less support in Paris for such an expedition. Louis of Orléans once more began to push for an invasion of Italy, but with Philip and Isabeau now united in opposition, and the general sentiment of France now against it, the plans were firmly shelved. The official position of the French court was one of support for Benedict while the schism continued, but with the addendum that it would be best for all Christendom if both popes stepped down. And so the schism continued, much to Philip's dismay, as it continued to cause headaches during the negotiations at Lollingham. But even so, the French could not force an end to the schism unilaterally. One of the debated conditions of a permanent peace would have included the French pressuring Benedict to resign, while the English did the same for Boniface. However, Richard II ended up refusing to put that pressure on the Roman pontiff. Rather than making this a sticking point, negotiations continued and in fact were close to producing a more stable peace than what had been agreed to back in 1389. But before we return to Lollingham, I want to catch up with Philip's ambitions in Europe. Throughout the past decade or so, Philip had been weaving a web of marriage alliances with his children. I already covered the weddings of his oldest son and daughter, John and Margaret, to the children of Albert of Bavaria, at the time of the wedding regent, and after 1389, Count of Haino, Holland, and Zealand. But Philip and his wife Margaret had several other children that they were able to use to expand Burgundian influence. Not all of the couple's children survived to actually be married, and not all of them were married during Philip's lifetime. But today, I want to focus on the matches made for three of his children, Catherine, Antoine, and Mary. Catherine was Philip's second oldest daughter, and was betrothed to Duke Leopold of Austria. Negotiations between Philip and the Habsburg Dukes of Austria had been going on since the 1370s. Now at some point, we're going to have to get formally introduced to the Habsburgs, but for now you mostly need to know that in addition to holding Austria, the Habsburgs also held territory in Alsace which bordered the county of Burgundy. Philip's goal in this match was to peel the county of Ferret away from the Habsburgs and to expand Burgundian influence into Alsace. This marriage was initially meant for his oldest daughter Margaret, but when the double wedding was negotiated, Philip swapped one daughter for another, and so Catherine was destined to be the first, but not the last, Burgundian to marry a Habsburg. The marriage took place in 1387, but Catherine wouldn't leave Philip's court until 1393. Furthermore, Leopold wouldn't transfer Ferret to Catherine until 1403, but in fairness to him, Philip had only paid a portion of Catherine's dowry and would never end up paying the full sum which had been agreed upon. Looking forward a bit, the couple ended up childless, which meant that Ferret was supposed to now go to Burgundy upon Catherine's death, but when Leopold died, his brother moved to seize the county over Catherine and her brother John's, now Duke of Burgundy, objections. Antoine, Philip's second oldest surviving son, was betrothed to Joan of Saint-Paul, daughter of Valeron of Luxembourg, the Count of Saint-Paul and Ligny, in 1393. As Count of Saint-Paul, Valeron was one of Philip's most powerful vassals in Artois, and was also one of Philip's best military commanders. The Count of Saint-Paul also had a dynastic claim on the Duchy of Luxembourg, another territory that Philip was keen to expand his influence into. Throughout the 1380s and 90s, Valeron launched several military expeditions into the duchy, with the goal of capturing it, or at least chipping away at the ducal domain. While none succeeded, the campaigns ended up being useful to Philip as a way that he could apply pressure to the House of Luxembourg, which also held the crowns of Germany and Bohemia at the time. While Philip was making arrangements to tie his family closer to Valerons, he was also making a deal with Joost, the current ruler of Luxembourg, for mutual defense with Luxembourg, Rethel, and the neighboring Duchy of Bar. This agreement served to tie Philip closer to Luxembourg by less aggressive means. After Joan's death, Antoine would marry another claimant to Luxembourg, but more on that in a future episode. Now on to Mary, Philip's youngest daughter. Like with Catherine, Philip wanted to use Mary to secure an alliance with one of the territories bordering the county of Burgundy, this time Savoy. The marriage between Mary and Amadeus, son of Count Amadeus VII, was arranged in 1386, but 
but the couple would not be married until 1393. By that time, the groom's father had died, so Mary was now being wed to Count Amadeus VIII. As the new Count of Savoy was a child at the time, this marriage allowed Philip to exert considerable influence over Savoy, becoming one of the county's regents shortly after the wedding. Thus, through the marriages of these three children, Philip was able to expand Burgundian power and secure some of his frontiers, especially those of the Franche Comte. In these marriages, especially those of his daughters, Philip could be hard to work with and greedy. He knew that his children made tempting prospects and didn't want to part with them. Both Catherine and Mary were betrothed years before they were wed, and then remained at the Burgundian court with Philip for even more years after the wedding had occurred. Admittedly, both had been married quite young, but Philip showed an attachment to his daughters that was fairly rare for the time. How far this attachment went is hard to say, as, for example, he never did finish paying for Catherine's dowry, something that caused her some discomfort later in her life. But now let's briefly catch up with what's been going on with England, so we can finish negotiating the Truce of Lollingham and finally end this almost 60-year-long war. Hmm, the 60 Years' War. That's catchy, but it could be better. Anyways, to understand how the peace negotiations were going, we have to check in on Richard II's domestic political situation. I skipped over this in the last narrative episode, but in 1387, a group of powerful nobles, known as the Lord's Appellant, launched a rebellion against Richard II with the goal of limiting his powers. This rebellion was partly due to the Lord's Appellant's dislike of the way that negotiations were going, and with Richard's apparent willingness to give up much more than was necessary, in their eyes, for peace. For their part, the lords didn't want any peace and would have preferred the war to continue, so what was too much to them could be quite reasonable to another. The negotiations at Lollingham were not the only cause of the rebellion, however. The lords had many other complaints, such as Richard's high-handing dealings with Parliament and the behaviors of his favorites. The rebellion of the lords' appellant was quite successful, and the months after the confrontation between royal and appellant forces saw royal power reduced greatly. There was even talk of overthrowing Richard. But the Lord's Appellant did not present the most united front once Richard had been sidelined and they had enemies of their own. The Scots saw the combination of political turmoil in England and the Lord's Appellant's aggressive plans towards France and knew that they had an opportunity. This Scottish invasion rocked the stability of the Appellant regime, as did lack of success in France. In 1389, Richard saw his chance to reassert his power. He recalled his uncle John of Gaunt to England and with Gaunt's political capital and Richard's new circle of allies and favorites, the uncle and nephew were able to re-establish royal authority. So in 1389, Richard was back in charge and more willing than ever to reach a peace agreement, and thus the truce was agreed to then. This peace allowed Richard to lower taxes, which both increased his popularity and meant that he wouldn't have to rely on Parliament as much. But although Richard was in a much stronger position now, he did not forget or forgive the Lord's Appellant. So negotiations continued until 1392, when the truce was set to expire. But as a permanent settlement had not yet been reached, the truce was extended again. Negotiations once more continued, now with John of Gaunt and Philip the Bold leading their respective sides once again. These negotiations proved fruitful, and a meeting between the kings was even scheduled for 1394, although it had to be called off due to Charles VI falling into another bout of madness. The biggest hurdle now was the English political class. Parliament would not accept the peace, and so it was back to the drawing board. Talks broke down shortly after news of the rejection reached Lollingham, although another four-year extension to the current truce was made, as was John of Gaunt's agreement to join Philip on a crusade. More on that shortly. But in 1395, talks resumed once more. Both delegations were anxious for peace, and so finally one was agreed to which simply ignored all the underlying tensions between the English and French crowns, rather than try and untangle the Gordian's knot. Charles managed to regain some lucidity in late 1395 and thus agreed to the terms. The truce, already in effect, was extended for another 28 years. Many of the roadblocks that stood in the way of peace in the past were ignored, and both kings would keep the land which they currently held. Ignored was the issue of homage for Aquitaine. Ignored was the subject of expanding Aquitaine to its former size. Ignored was Richard's claim on the crown of France. The biggest change to the two kingdoms' strategic positions was that Richard had agreed to give up a few English-held ports in Normandy and Brittany, but was richly compensated for them, and kept Calais, much to the disappointment of Philip, whose territory directly bordered it. Charles's young daughter Isabel would be betrothed to Richard, single now for a few years. 
with the addendum that their children would be disqualified from any right to inherit the French crown. The French had certainly learned their lesson from the last time an English king married a French princess. The signing of this latest truce and marriage both took place in 1396. It was a huge win for Philip and the French, and somewhat of a disappointment for the English, but not to Richard. He did not have the same attachment to his continental possessions that many of the lords of the realm did, and at the end of the day did not have to give up that much for the peace. Richard was more eager for peace than Parliament was, but they were unwilling to grant him subsidies to fight the war, so how much did he really need to appease them? He still had domestic problems to deal with, and in exchange for signing, he gained a new bride and a huge, but only monetary, dowry. Both sides agreed to launch a crusade against the Ottoman Turks, to make some attempts to end the papal schism, and to keep working towards a permanent peace. But this iteration of the Truce of Lollingham would remain largely unchanged, at least while Richard was king. After all, I have been calling it the Truce of Lollingham rather than the Treaty of Lollingham this whole time. So with peace assured for the foreseeable future, attention moved east. In 1389, Ottoman forces under Sultan Murad I faced off against the Serbian prince Lazar on the plains of Kosovo. The battle was extremely bloody, yet indecisive. At the end of the day, both Lazar and Murad lay dead on the field, and both armies had taken significant losses. But the consequences of this battle would be immense. The eldest son of the sultan, Bayezid, moved quickly to take charge. Lazar's son Stephen saw where the winds were blowing and decided to submit to the new sultan. Under Murad, the Ottomans had begun to conquer territory in Europe, and under Bayezid, this trend would continue at an alarming pace. With the Serbian army destroyed, Hungary saw its chance to expand its influence southwards, while the Ottomans began to move north. Before long, the Kingdom of Hungary and the Ottoman Empire were on each other's doorstep. Crusades against the Ottomans were not a novelty, but now they took on an increased level of urgency. Calls began to go out from Hungary to the rest of Western Christendom, preaching a new crusade. Calls which were heard, and many of the leading men began to make plans to take the cross. These plans made their way into Lollingham, where John of Gaunt, Philip the Bold, and Louis of Orléans all agreed to come to the aid of Hungary once peace between England and France was assured. And now that it was, preparations began. Next time, we'll begin a three-episode miniseries covering the Crusade of Nicopolis. My original plan was to cover the Crusade of Nicopolis in a single episode, but my script for that episode has ballooned into about three times the normal episode length so the next three episodes will all be dedicated to the crusade. If you want to hear everything at once, I will be posting a mega episode to my Patreon alongside the third installment of the miniseries. So in two weeks, we'll journey east to get acquainted with the Kingdom of Hungary and the Ottoman Empire. Thank you to my patrons. We have a new patron, James, the Graf von Temsa, and also to Christine, Comte de Chenonceau, Elliot, Graf von Gravenstein, Anthony, Comte de chateauneuf en and to my Knights of the Duchy. If you want to join them, you can at patreon.com slash Burgundy. If you like the show, I would really appreciate it if you would rate and review it on Apple Podcasts or your platform of choice, and tell your friends about it. If you want to keep up with the show, you can follow me at twitter.com slash Burgundy, or find Grand Dukes of the West on Facebook, or on Mastodon at mas.to slash at Burgundy. You can also email me at granddukesofthewest at gmail.com and check out the podcast website for maps, images, and more at granddukesofthewest.com.